Hey, it's showtime. Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. The topic for this episode is supermarket methods of temperature control, evaporator pressure regulators, otherwise known as EPRs. This is the 10th, if I recall correctly, and I was able to count that high with my shoes still on my feet, in a series of presentations that will follow the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporlin had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that went around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. With this Tech Talk entry, we are bringing the supermarket seminar concept back and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process. Here's a shameless promotion for the next set of webinars we plan to do. In September, we're going to stretch ourselves. We're actually going to do something a little different. We're actually going to be broadcasting two webinars. The one on September the 3rd will be a basic presentation that covers the concept of refrigeration. In fact, it is simply called, What is Refrigeration? And it's part one. This webinar would be perfect for anyone who wants a better understanding of the vapor compression refrigeration cycle or for someone simply wanting a review. We'll do part two the following month in October. Then to make things even more interesting in September, we're doing a second webinar. This will follow the schedule of the ongoing supermarket series and we will continue our discussion on methods of temperature control with electric evaporator regulators. We'll broadcast that webinar on September the 17th. Hope you'll join us for both. Here are a few simple instructions on the, if the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you could simply dial in with your phone. There should be a phone number somewhere on the invitation that you originally received. But here it is on the slide in case you don't have it handy. We both have an 800 number and a direct dial and then the conference code. As we move along and you have questions, you could type those questions into the Q&A window. We'll answer some of those questions live as we have time. It's, sometimes we'll run out of time for that. But here's the thing, if you'll hang on and be patient, there's a good bet that we may actually answer your question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, this webinar is being recorded, which is kind of a reminder for our internal support staff to make sure that they are recording this. Should we run into any broadcasting problems today, you could always go back and listen to the recorded version. It'll appear first on Facebook Live for your listening pleasure. And then later on, after we do a few edits, we'll post it out on the Sporland YouTube channel. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Application Team. That's me on the left. And joining me today is Kevin Freeman. Kevin is a Senior Application Engineer on the Sporland Technical Support Team. Now, Kevin is one of those rare guys with over 30 years of experience. He's held a variety of positions during that time here at Sporland, ranging from quality control to production management, actually product management. And there is a better than average chance that you received expert help from him if you've ever called our tech support line. And we're really excited to have Kevin join us today. Hey, say hi to everybody, Kevin. Hello, everyone. I'm happy you could join us today. If you have any follow-up questions or feedback, you may contact us via email or contact the Sporland Technical Support Team at svdtechsupport at parker.com. Or you can always call 636-239-1111. That's the general number for our headquarters in Washington, Missouri. We'll show this information again. Also, you can see our individual email addresses underneath our images there on the, on the slide. We don't do this every time, but occasionally we'll pop up this basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And just to remind you, you know, from our point of view, there's four primary components. There's a compressor, which compresses the low pressure temperature vapor to a high pressure temperature vapor. And then, a, and then of course, the, the condenser, uh, you know, that's where heat's being rejected. And of course, the refrigerant is being condensed into a liquid. Uh, the metering device, which in this case is being conveyed as a thermostatic expansion valve. It can be a number of different items. Uh, that's the metering device, which helps deliver refrigerant via the distributor into the evaporator. The evaporator, of course, absorbs the heat from the space that you're trying to cool, and the refrigerant changes phase both there as well as in the condenser. And it's important to remember 
that it is those four primary components that make the system work as you move into more complex systems as in a multiplex rack. Here's an application of that basic refrigeration cycle. It looks quite complicated, but again, always remember there are only four primary components in every system. We'll be discussing a specific aspect of that here in this particular webinar. We're going to be dealing with that highlighted portion of the slide, uh, specifically uh, pressure regulators, specifically evaporator pressure regulators, which control evaporator pressure. It's just that simple. I guess you could say we're done, huh, Kevin? Is that all we need to talk about? Uh, not quite, Jim. Okay. Well, the, the refrigerant in the evaporator, by intention, is in a saturated condition. As a result of that fact, by controlling the pressure in the evaporator, the associated saturated temperature will ultimately be a result of that. There is a correlation between the saturation temperature in the evaporator and the discharge air temperature, or leaving evaporator temperature. The air conditioning guys would call that supply air temperature. And this is based upon the heat transfer characteristics of the evaporator itself. Now, spoil and evaporator pressure regulators, or EPRs, are designed to provide a means of accurately maintaining evaporator pressure and providing a consistent temperature under varying evaporator load conditions, especially as the load drops off. So when the evaporator load increases, the Sporlin valve will open on a rise of inlet pressure above the set point of the EPR. And in effect, the nomenclature of the EPR implies how it actually functions. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. Here are, here's a small example of the many different types of evaporator pressure regulators that are available from us. The ORIT 6 and 10 are direct acting valves. That's what you'd see here with standard, standard adjustment ranges and fitting options. The SORIT 12, 15, and 20 are what are called externally piloted valves. And the SORIT PI represents products that are internally piloted valves. Uh, both provide more capacity and include additional features as compared to the direct acting versions. Now over here on the left, the sport valve. This is just one of the many EPRs manufactured by another Parker division, Refrigerating Specialties. They do a lot of industrial products, but they have a lot of crossover products with ours as well. These Refrigerating Specialty products cover a really wide range of applications, and we will broadcast a special webinar dedicated to those products in the future. So stay tuned for that. Many supermarkets use multiple evaporators piped to a common suction header. These evaporators can be operated at different temperatures for the various products being refrigerated. While this is a common application for pilot operated EPRs, depending upon the size of the system, a direct acting EPR will do the trick. Sort of as what we've shown here, because there's a direct acting EPR installed in this system. An EPR is likely to be required when the desired saturation temperature in an evaporator or group of evaporators is higher than the saturation temperature corresponding to the common suction pressure. The Sporlin EPR provides the flexibility to allow multiple evaporator systems to operate at different temperatures when piped to a common suction group. Understanding valve operation of different EPR models is critical to ensuring proper product selection for each application. Traditionally, EPRs are applied at the outlet of the evaporator and control evaporator of valve inlet pressure, but that's all they do. Just sort of as a review, pressure regulators in general can control inlet pressure or outlet pressure or pressure differential, but only one. For example, this valve opens on a rise of inlet pressure hence the ORI designation. The T represents the fact that there's a pressure tap included in this product. 
Note the valve cannot be installed in reverse to handle any other pressure regulating valve function. And just to keep in mind as sort of a tip off on these style of valves, the inlet pressure acts directly on the seat disc opposing the adjustment spring. So here's the adjustment assembly. Here's the seat disc and the seat. Now let's talk a little about, about installation precaution and paint. Sporlin has utilized battleship gray paint for years to paint steel parts. We commonly painted many brass and copper products for purely cosmetic purposes. And because of improvements to our manufacturing operation, that enhanced product appearance we have decided to eliminate. The paint on the ORIT 6 and 10, here you can see the results. Extended fittings are also an, operation, an option on this product line. That feature helps to prevent overheating during the installation process as the valve is brazed into the system. The sort valve uses discharge gas pressure to pilot the piston. Kevin, I'm going to ask for you to tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, as far as the source of discharge operating, that means that the pilot-operated valve typically not used with a so-called loop piping system. You might ask why. Well, because of the source of the discharge gas is not likely available on the store floor. So instead, this type of valve would typically be used with a circuit pipe design and located at the compressor rack in the mechanical room. <clears throat> this may be a good time to talk about the S in the nomenclature. As far as the S and what is it designated, it is meaning that the valve is solenoid operated. If you drop the S, there is no solenoid on top of the valve. <clears throat> and only refrigerant vapor should be used, only refrigerant vapor should be used as the high pressure source supply to the pilot valve. Here are some suggestions for regarding the pilot source. You should keep the pilot line as short as possible, minimize refrigerant condensation, kind of, <clears throat> which kind of defeats the purpose of a discharge gas pilot if it condenses. The, always the high pressure source should be at least 50 PSI greater than downstream or common suction pressure. And then if used with a gas defrost system, the pilot supply source must be at the same or higher pressure as compared to the dis de defrost gas source. Okay, one of the evaporators in this slide is depicted as being a defrost cycle. And we can talk about the flow through the components, including the check valve at the TEV location. On most refrigerant applications require an occasional defrost cycle to clear the frost or ice from the evaporator. This helps to maintain proper performance and control of the refrigerated space. Okay, there are also a number of ways to defrost an evaporator with hot gas defrost only is one such method. The sort valve is equipped with a suction stop solenoid that will close the valve when de-energized. This will assist with any of the traditional methods of defrost. In the case of the gas defrost, the high pressure vapor is usually introduced upstream of the EPR. And the sort solenoid stop feature is used to prevent the defrost gas from entering the suction line and overheating or overloading the compressors. Here's a little bit about how it works. Kevin's doing a good job there. We're gonna probably switch back and forth here. We kind of talked about what's, what the S means in the, in, the nomen, in the nomenclature. We already covered that. The solenoid valve must be energized in order for the valve to modulate. To defrost the evaporator, the solenoid component of the valve is de-energized to allow discharge gas to dump on top of the piston and provide a positive closing action. We have an animation coming up that shows how this all works better than what we can explain. Okay, now we're gonna talk about flow through the valve. Uh, remember, it takes a minute for the animation to commence. 
and turn and it runs for about one minute. So the suction pressure will enter the valve from the left and travels through the pilot tube to the pilot valve. Suction pressure acts on the bottom of the diaphragm. When pressure is low, the diaphragm flexes and comes into contact with the push rods and allows the flow of the discharge gas to the top of the piston. This so-called ex externally piloted feature of the valve the valve modulates to a more closed position and causes the evaporator pressure to increase. Pressure on top of the piston is constantly bleeding to the suction side of the system. This allows the valve to modulate to a more open position when the evaporator pressure increases above the set point of the valve. Piloting, piloting the valve with high side vapor allows a normally open valve design that can operate with a minimum pressure drop of a half a pound or half a PSI. Now high, high pressure source closed valve open. For dual temp applications, an auxiliary sol solenoid can be installed in the discharge gas line. When, when closed, the sort will go wide open and the case will pull down to the common suction pressure. A Sporlin A3 or an E3 solenoid valve could be installed in the high pressure vapor line to accommodate this function. And always remember when selecting solenoid valves that size does matter. Solenoid valves are designed to operate in conjunction with specific conditions, not simply line size. Hey, hey Kevin, hey Kevin, what's an example of a dual temperature application? Well, Jim, uh, on a dual temp application, you'd be talking like on a medium temp uh, and say for one instance, like a meat case, and then maybe you decide you want to go to uh, low temp, which you'd be looking at frozen foods. Uh, you can just do that with the flip of a switch. So that might happen like uh, around Thanksgiving. Maybe you wanted frozen turkeys in there through the holidays. And then you want to do some kind of fresh produce as you go into the spring. Correct. That would be right, Jim. Here in a loop system comments, direct acting or internally piloted EPRs are typically used on systems with the evaporator groups piped to a common liquid and suction line that has been looped throughout the store. The EPRs are installed in or near the refrigerated case in these, the, I'm sorry, in these systems. That means the EPRs are actually out on the store floor. Examples would be the ORIT 6 and 10, the SORIT PI, which is internally piloted, and the range of refrigerating specialty products. So during defrost, the SORIT PI valve can also accommodate hot gas flow with the suction stop solenoid feature that will close the valve when de-energized, just like the SORIT version. The sport valve is shown with a two-way solenoid defrost valve. Okay, these valves are piloted internally and do not require a high side pressure source to operate. The valves are operated by the pressure differential across the valve and these valves do require a minimum pressure drop of one PSI to obtain the full capacity. Be careful. Oversizing these valves can result in erratic operation. The pilot valve modulates in response to the upstream or inlet pressure just like the sort. However, as inlet pressure is transmitted through the internal passageway to the underside of the pilot valve diaphragm, the valve works without an external pilot to get the job done. And ultimately, it'll control evaporator pressure and the associated temperature. If you'll note, the solenoid is energized to provide for the modulating feature of the valve to function and de-energized to accommodate the defrost cycle. Okay, the, the uh, sort pi up to our date code of 3104, which is the week in the year. So that'd be the valve on the left, 
and the sort by date code 3204 until present. If you notice the difference between them, the external bleed line from the pilot assembly on the valve on the right, it's threaded and removable. It's a new bleed piston. On some of the problems we see in oversized valves can be a big problem during low load conditions and you'll get sketchy performance or erratic performance. There is a bleed in the nose piece to settle that down and give it more stable control. Finally, the added quarter inch bleed line, probably the best fixed, would be a, a conversion to a completely new valve. The CDS we'll discuss next month in our webinar. That's a bit harsh, isn't it, Kevin? Tell them they got a change to an electric valve. Hey, troubleshooting sorts. Let's say the EPR will not hold setting and we're having low pressure. Kevin, what sort of things should we consider? Well, you might first verify the valve setting. You can uh, turn, turn the adjustment screw clockwise to raise your setting and counterclockwise to lower it. Uh, you want to ensure that the hot gas is flowing to the pilot connection, and it may also, there is a strainer in there, you may need to clean that strainer. Um, sometimes the pilot valve may get contaminated with debris. If you're... Uh, well, let's say the EPR won't hold setting, but it's a high pressure problem, like we've got depicted here. Well, in the event that it's a high pressure uh, possible your bleed line could be restricted or you've got debris or contamination causing the piston to stick and hang up in the main body of the valve. That's a good point. Hey, uh, we've got a question that came in and one of the things, I'm going to back up a few slides and, and just so that you know, and I think this is the case, Kevin, you can straighten me out. When we're going into a defrost cycle, that, that suction stop solenoid feature needs to be de-energized, whether it's on a sort pi or a sort, right? Isn't that right, Kevin? That, that would be correct, Jim. So we had a question that we might have confused things a little bit. For the valve to operate, whether it's a sort pi or a sort, the solenoid has to be energized so it promotes flow through the valve and allows the modulation feature to take place. Does that sound right? Uh, that would be correct, Jim. Yes, energize modulation. Now here's, we've got some more troubleshooting tips that we want to pass on regarding some of these products. I, I'm a little confused about this here. What, what's the big deal? I mean, I always thought if tight was good, real tight's even better. So what are we telling people here? Kevin, tell me about this. Uh, well, in this slide, you want to pay attention to basically the uh, enclosing tube lock nut. Uh, we have mentioned and we have it published in our literature. As far as tightening that down, that would be to nine to 10 foot pounds of tightening. Uh, some people have, we've seen in different returns where there'll be an issue. Somebody thinks like Jim was mentioning that the tighter the better and they put a cheater bar on there and it actually will deform that enclosing tube and kind of get it out around or egg shaped and the uh, piston in there the uh, has to ride up and down it hangs up in the enclosing tube when that happens so the torque values we have published in our bulletin 30-11 regarding the installation of solenoid valves and that will give you other product lines also as far as torque values and if you want to look that up, uh, you can go to www.sporlin.com under the literature tab. And like I said, the bulletin you want to look at is you'll be at section 30. Open that up and you'll click on bulletin 30-11, which is the installation service bulletin for solenoid valves. Here we've got some rebuilding information and we're showing... That I mean, I always thought these valves just lasted forever, but we're trying to make it fact that they can indeed last forever by offering pilot valve kits, internal parts kits, gaskets, and O-rings. But what's going on down here with the different enclosing tube seals? Kevin, tell us about that. 
Well, the one on the uh, far left, Jim, that would have been the earliest version of the enclosing tube uh, design. If you notice the four screws holding the enclosing tube on the uh, sort body, uh, there was an O-ring seal down underneath that. And then the next one in the middle, which ended up being starting uh, with the date code prior to 1998, after the four screw model went to another type O ring. And then the one that is currently from the uh, to present, from the 98 to present, we went to a metal Wolverine type gasket. And we've always said over time that anytime, especially if you have a refrigerant conversion, we always recommend that you change out the seals because over time we found that with our testing and experiences on uh, valves of these nature, the rubber O-rings and in the rubber Tetra seals uh, are most likely to take a set and you will have leaks if you do not change those out. Now the improvement was the Wolverine uh, metal gasket and that's what we use today. We find it's a much better seal. Thanks, Kevin. We get asked, how does glide affect EPR settings? And here we're trying to depict the refrigeration cycle on a pH diagram to kind of illustrate that. And just to remember, if the, if the refrigerant in the system exhibits glide, it's imperative to utilize the dew point temperature to calculate superheat at the exit of the evaporator when you're dialing in the expansion valve. This slide, of course, depicts an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. That means no pressure drop in the condenser and evaporator and isentropic compression here and all of that stuff. But, and normally, the TV would be at the factory setting or the OEM's predetermined setting prior to adjusting the EPR. Now, there's a little bit of controversy regarding the calculation of the starting point for that adjustment if the refrigerant exhibits a glide. You know, you know, that's refrigerants that are a mix of constituents that boil off at different temperatures. Some say use the dew point temperature for the calculation. Others say base it on an average of the dew point and the actual entering evaporator temperature. Now, either method's gonna get you in the ballpark, so to speak. Ultimately, one could adjust the EPR to achieve the specified or desired discharge air temperature for the refrigerated case. This will work with refrigerants that exhibit a glide and with those that don't. Now, Kevin, if someone calls tech support and asks you about this, are you going to tell them anything different? Jim, I'd have to agree with you 100% on that. Awesome. Finally, one could fine tune the TEV for ultimate superheat control at the bulb after they went through this process. Now, how well does this all work? Well, here's a log of data that was acquired on a system with a mechanical evaporator pressure regulator. There's a medium temp system. Uh, this graph displays case temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, discharge air temperature, if you will, versus time. The set point was approximately 36 degrees, and you can see the big spikes are illustrative of, I guess that's a defrost cycle. Wouldn't that make sense, Kevin? That yes, looks good. As you can see, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus one degree. In fact, we've spelled that out here. This is a pretty efficient way of controlling temperature. Now let's compare the performance of this method with the other method we discussed last month. We talked about taking a liquid line solenoid valve, cycling it in conjunction with a thermostat. And here with a similar medium temp situation, we're looking at plus or minus three degrees. So that's a pretty big difference. Which one would you pick? I would go with the mechanical EPR for efficiency. If you're satisfied with the results here with the solenoid valve, I'm not going to argue with it, but it's not quite as good. Well, wow, we're almost coming to the end of this. We're kind of wrapping this up. Just as a reminder, you can contact us by phone, either directly to headquarters or to technical support. We even got an email address where you can reach guys like Kevin and he'll answer your questions. We're also available 24 hours a day. You can stay connected with us through our solutions at parker.com, 
We got tech support, product literature, training, e-newsletters, product videos, events, new product releases. You can stay connected with us through Twitter, Facebook, our climate control blog, and our Sporlin YouTube channel. And again, I'm, I presume we've got a few questions along the way. If there are any questions we didn't answer, we'll go back and address them online. And just as a reminder, September the 3rd, part one, what is refrigeration? September the 17th, more methods of temperature control. We're going to deal with the electronically controlled, electrically actuated evaporator pressure regulators. Kevin, is there any questions that we missed that we ought to address? Because we're almost at the end of this. It, I've uh, got one that was sent in that from Matthew. It says he has an older ORIT valve, and it's piped to the liquid line. It says, does, do all of them have to be piped to the discharge line? Well, that's, that's a good question. I, I think you kind of covered that. I mean, it's important to have a short length of pilot line run, and it's important for it to be a high enough pressure. That's correct, Jim. It has it should be discharge gas um, to get actual, uh, I want to say, efficient modulation of the valve. Because if you start to condense in that line, it's not going to operate correctly. I think there's some exceptions along the way. There are certain OEMs that have done it by connecting to the receiver in the past. And, you know, if the OEM checks it all out, they're happy with how it works. We generally don't argue with that unless it doesn't work. And then, then it's time to reconsider. So we got webinars coming up. We hope you'll join us. And this concludes our webinar on refrigerant applications involving methods of temperature control utilizing the EPR. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us next time.